Hello everybody, welcome. Today I'm going to walk through an example uh, in Excel, uh, creating an optimal risky portfolio, but now with four assets. Uh, and once we create that optimal risk risky portfolio and the weights corresponding to each one of those assets, I'm going to show you in what portion of uh, that portfolio an investor should hold depending on their risk aversion level. And so here's the spreadsheet, guys. You're going to see that uh, I already have a lot of the columns filled in just to save some time here uh, you remember you can always pause the video scroll back etc I'm gonna try to keep it under 15 minutes so we're gonna go pretty fast here but you can see that I already have uh, four streams of price data for four assets uh, that trade on the TSX here in Canada so we have Rogers Barrick Gold BMO and Loblaw so four assets here and the data is monthly data going back until the beginning of 2014 so we have just about three years of data here and so these are the raw price statistics again if you're looking to how to download that from uh, from Yahoo or some other different sources you can go back to some previous videos and here are some the first four columns that we need to fill in here so these are the returns for these four uh, columns here or four assets so the return on uh, on Rogers is going to be equal to the natural log of uh, today's price or the most current price divided by the previous months we hit enter uh, there's a return measure for the month we can just simply scroll this over to fill in uh, the other uh, four assets for the first month there double click uh, on this uh, bottom right corner and this will drop the return measures and fill in all the measures for those four assets on a monthly basis if we scroll down to the bottom you're going to see that we have uh, row 48, our, our, our 47th month of our data. Uh, doesn't have a return measure because there's no month in the previous month of that to uh, show you uh, the return there. I'm not sure what happened there. So we can just delete those guys there, okay? We don't need any of those guys. They can sometimes create problems in, in some of the analysis going forward. So that last row should always be uh, blank like that. You won't have a number that, sh that shows up. So the next step, we have a return series stream now for our th approximately three years of data. Uh, next is going to be to calculate the monthly returns for uh, Rogers, Barrick, BMO, and Loblaws. So simply if I hit uh, equals, I can hit average, open this parentheses, and I can just grab uh, the return series for uh, Rogers that we have close that parentheses enter and there's a return measure uh, on an average monthly return measure for Rogers and again simply we can just slide this over like that for our four measures and we can see that we have return measures now for Rogers positive uh, somewhat corresponding to uh, both uh, Loblaws and BMO similar kind of returns here uh, and then we can see Barrick uh, had a, kind of a bad probably last three years. Their average monthly return is actually negative. So that's the first uh, measure that we need. The next measure that we're going to have to to calculate is going to be uh, the variance. And we'll take the variance of uh, the sample here. And this is going to be uh, the exact same thing. So this is going to be the variance. We need the, the measures here. This is going to be of, of, uh, of Rogers, this RCI ticker for Rogers. This is going to calculate the monthly variance for Rogers and simply we can do the same thing we just did for the monthly returns. So now we have both the uh, average monthly returns and the monthly variance for our four different assets that we're going to uh, examine. Here I'm going to calculate the average annual returns. So this is going to be fairly straightforward. I'm just going to take the monthly average returns. I'm just going to multiply this by 12. This is going to give us uh, the average annual returns. I'm going to drop this over. You can see again, this should correspond. You know, Rogers, BMO, and Loblaws have fairly similar return measures uh, for the last uh, three years. And Barrett Gold has, has obviously underperformed. Uh, for variance, we're going to do the same thing. So this is going to equal uh, the monthly variance times by 12. And we're going to simply draw this over now okay so here's a box that we're going to kind of uh, use here going forward to examine uh, how we should uh, create a portfolio uh, with these four different assets now you might think well why would I put any 
money in Barrick. Look, Barrick has actually uh, been a negative performer over the last three years. Uh, how is this going to add value to my portfolio? Well, we're going to see when we get down here and calculate the optimal risky portfolio. Even though uh, it's providing negative returns, it might still add some diversification value uh, in terms of uh, the holdings of your assets. Okay, so here I'm going to just uh, separate uh, this the, the the yearly return measures into uh, into this row here. This is going to help us in in calculating uh, some of the expected returns for both the equally weighted portfolio and the optimal portfolio. So simply, this is going to equal um, the average annual returns. So this cell here is going to equal uh, the average annual returns for RCI. This cell is going to equal the average annual returns for ABX. This cell here is going to equal the average annual returns for BMO, and the cell here is going to equal the average annual returns for Loblaws. So those are our four stocks that we have, four very well-known stocks uh, in Canada. Uh, before we go forward into the Varix covariance matrix, I just want to make sure it's going to be a little bit easier if we uh, if we name our columns, and, and I've already actually done this, okay? So you can see here when I click on uh, the F column for the returns of Rogers, you're going to see over here that I already have this uh, box filled in. It's, it's already named RCI. And this is going to make it a lot easier for us to go forward in terms of calculating this variance covariance matrix if we if we name each one of these columns. So in order to do that, you can just click on uh, the column like that, go over to uh, this header here. You can type in RCI, enter, and it's going to name that column RCI. And I've done this for these all four columns. So you can see if I click on this column, this column's named RCI, column's named ABX, column's named BMO, column's named uh, L for Law Plus. Okay, so make sure you do that for all four columns there. Now, if we get into uh, the variance covariance matrix, will be the next step uh, along our journey here. Simply, uh, we're going to take the variance covariance of these four. We're going to have to create a table here. And I'm just going to do the first uh, one, and then I'm going to pause it because it's going to be a lot of repetition you're going to see how how we go about and, and do the variance covariance matrix okay so the variance covariance matrix is going to be covar open parentheses here we're going to have rci so rci comma rci close parentheses times 12 we're going to get the annual okay the annual uh, covariance matrix here this is going to create uh, the covariance measure for this, right? RCI and RCI, these two columns here, or the column row. The next one is going to equal, again, covar, oops, covar, open parentheses. This is going to be now RCI and ABX. Okay, so we do that, and we times by 12. I'm going to pause the video here because I'm going to go across this row, and I'm going to do the same thing uh, to fill in all 12 boxes. So I'm going to pause it for a second, come back with all these filled in, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Okay, so we have the full covariance matrix filled in now. If you click on that, you can see uh, the different uh, code that has been put in here, covariance between ABX and ABX. Here are the covariance between BMO and ABX times 12. So again, this is uh, going to take... A minute of your time to fill this in, but uh, you didn't have to watch me fill all that in. We have that covariance uh, variance matrix uh, filled out now. So we have our returns. We have our our, our summary statistics here. We have a covariance uh, variance covariance matrix. We have here the risk-free rate, and again, we're going to get to this A measure or what the risk aversion measure of uh, the investor is down here when we're going to calculate what portion of uh, this portfolio that uh, investors should have. But let's first go to the equally weighted portfolio. So if I put in uh, with four assets, so if I put in, uh, if I'm holding uh, point, uh, 25%, oops, let's go back here. If I hold 25% and each one of these assets like this, uh, this is going to equal the sum of these four, right? Which can't be more than one. Okay, so these should all add up to one in an equally weighted portfolio. What is going to be my expected return if I hold, you know, these four assets in proportion? What, what should I expect the return on that? And I can do this uh, simply with this M, M, Alt, uh code and we have to transpose and we're going to transpose these weights here right so we're going to turn these columns into a row we close that with a parentheses comma and then we're going to add the returns here and so these returns right that we have 
we can add those in close the parenthesis then we're going to hold control shift enter and our expected return on this portfolio should be approximately a 9.5 percent okay and so that's the, here's the code here remember you can always pause and go back to that okay now we're going to do the standard deviation of this portfolio so this is going to equal sqrt open parentheses mm alt open parentheses again mm malt and remember guys you can always go back slow down this is going to be a little bit more of a of a longer equation we're going to transpose uh the weights so we're going to transpose this series here uh close parentheses comma then we're going to add in this variance covariance matrix over here close parentheses uh, comma uh, then we're going to add the weights here without transposing so we add these weights again without transposing uh, close this two extra close control shift enter and we can see the standard deviation of this portfolio is going to be approximately 13 percent if we have this equally weighted portfolio so we have these two measures here and these two measures are going to be the expected return standard deviation for holding uh, an equally weighted portfolio of rogers barrett bmo and uh, loblaws Okay, so now let's do the uh, optimal risky portfolio. And we're going to go through somewhat of the same uh, steps we just did. Uh, let's put in some weights here. Again, these are going to be equally uh, varied weights. We're going to see when we go use the solver, we're going to change some of these. These are going to equal the sum of all these weights. And we'll we need to do that because we're going to get into the solver here in a second. We're going to do the same thing we did before just to double check some of our work. And, uh, and to use this, we're going to transpose uh the weights here so these are their weights okay close parentheses comma and then we're going to add uh the returns here close parentheses control shift enter again 9.57 corresponds to our our measure we just calculated and this one is going to be sqrt uh open parentheses uh mm alt uh open parentheses again mm alt uh, open parentheses transpose open parentheses we're going to do these weights here close parentheses uh, comma the variance covariance matrix uh, close parentheses comma and then we're just going to add the weights not being transposed close parentheses close parentheses control shift enter and there we go we have both of those measures we just did. Now let's calculate the Sharpe ratio. So you guys should know what the Sharpe ratio is from the book, but it's the expected return of the portfolio. So open parentheses expected return minus now uh, the risk-free rate. So we have the risk-free rate all the way up there. That's why we had it in there. We're going to use it again in a second. Divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio. So here we can see the Sharpe ratio for this portfolio equally weighted is approximately 0.348%. So um, not great. Uh, again, we we'll could probably get that a little bit better, and that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to optimize that. So how do we do that? We're going to go to data. We're going to go to uh, the solver over here. Click on solver, and I'm just going to reset all of this for now so you guys can 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 go through it easily if you have some data in there you should reset it what i'm going to do i'm going to try to 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 maximize our sharp ratio so i'm going to click on the sharp ratio here i'm going to try to maximize that and by changing what values i'm going to be trying to change these weighting values so i highlight those weighting values in there and then i have to add a constraint because the constraint remember we can't hold more than 100 percent of our portfolio uh, we, Potentially we could, but in, in this scenario, we're going to see how uh, we're going to put constraints on without short selling and some other aspects we can do here. So we're going to add a constraint, and the constraint is going to equal this sum cell here, and this is going to have to equal to 1. Okay, so we add that in. Again, make constraint variables non-negative, so this is kind of the assumption that you can't short uh, specific assets. If we click Solve... It's going to say, hey, we have a solver solution. We click OK. And the solver solution now shows us what portion of these assets should be held in the portfolio. So you're going to see here uh, we should hold up 25% in, in Rogers, nothing in Barrick, about 43.7% BMO, 
30% in Loblaws. And with that, that's going to optimize this portfolio, giving you a sharp ratio of just over 1.12%. So that's an example of portfolio optimization.